A human peasant born on the sparsely populated world of Somov Rit, Zana was recruited into the Jedi Army of Light just before the final Battle of Rusin in 1000 BBY. However, the vessel carrying her and her fellow recruits was shot down by Sith forces above Rusin, though Zana survived the crash, protected by La, one of the Rusanian bouncers. When her guardian was mistakenly killed by Jedi, Zana lashed out and killed them, this demonstration of her latent power bringing her to the attention of Darth Bane. Having just engineered the destruction of the Sith Brotherhood of Darkness, Bane set about reforming the Sith Order under the rule of two, and recruited Zana as his apprentice. Years of harsh training crafted Zana into a manipulative seductress and a powerful Sith sorceress. In 980 BBY, she challenged Darth Bane for the mantle of Dark Lord, and after a fierce battle on the desert plains of Ambria, she emerged victorious. Taking the Iktachi Darth Cognus as her apprentice, Lord Zana set about fulfilling Darth Bane's imperative the destruction of the Jedi Order and the Galactic Republic, and the perpetuation of the Sith Order via the Rule of Two. The Takruta Jedi Master Shakti had the misfortune of living in the era when the schemes of Darth's Bane and Zana finally bore fruit. While she successfully completed her own Jedi training, both of Shakti's early students were killed in action, causing some among the Jedi to question her merits as an instructor. Despite this, she attained the rank of Master, and after the death of Jedi Council Master Yaddle in 26 BBY, T was nominated to replace her on the August body. Shakti was one of the participants in the Battle of Geonosis, the initial engagement of the Clone Wars, and was shoehorned into serving as a Jedi General. Rising to prominence as a noted Jedi war hero, Shakti was one of the survivors of Order 66, the culmination of all the Sith schemes since the Battle of Rusin. While the Jedi Order was destroyed and the Galactic Republic was reformed into the Sith-controlled Galactic Empire, Shakti fled the chaos and went into hiding on Felucia. She was eventually located by Darth Vader, who sent his assassin, Galen Merrick, to kill her. After a fierce battle above the maw of the Ancient Abyss, a Mega Sarlacc used as a sacrificial altar by the native Felucians, Shakti was defeated. She was survived by her latest student, Maris Brood, who fell to the dark side in the wake of her death and ran wild across Felucia, before also being targeted by Marek. Hello YouTube! This is Jen Sarai, the Nerd Rage Ranter, as interpreted by Matt Chapman. He and I have long been interested in some sort of collaborative effort, so we figured letting him build the video around my voiceover was a good place to start. I was interested to see how my scripting, presentation, and vocal style meshed with his visual aesthetic. The inspiration behind this matchup was twofold. I've been wanting to use Shock T for a while, and was inspired to use Darth Zana by Matt's magnum opus, Darth Bane and Darth Zana vs. Mace Windu and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Plus, many of my subscribers, many of you, have been complaining about the lack of new characters in my Versus series, as well as the lack of female characters. So I came up with a way to answer both criticisms. Without further delay, let's get underway. Darth Zana was the apprentice of Darth Bane one of the greatest lightsaber duelists of the era, and so inherited a rich pedigree of martial knowledge and training. Bane was a fierce advocate of Dejem So, which he referred to as Strong Style, and while he did acknowledge the benefits of Sirisu, or Fast Style as he called it, he ultimately considered the style's focus on technical sophistication and skill rather than rage-fueled offensives to be ill-suited for most Sith. 
Zana was the exception to this, as Bane pragmatically judged that her light physique and lack of significant muscle mass left her ill-suited for the brute force offensive methods he encouraged, so he steered her towards Sarisu. Sarisu, the third form of lightsaber combat, was a purely defensive fighting style based around tight, efficient movements to provide maximum defensive coverage and to conserve energy, maximizing combative longevity. Bane trained her to rely on redirection and deflection to conserve energy, while she waited until her adversary gave in to fatigue or frustration and moving to exploit the resulting openings. To this end, she was taught to rely on quickness, cunning, and most of all, patience. In keeping with this reliance on quickness, her speed and agility were well developed, allowing her to utilize highly effective acrobatic evasions and recoveries. Her technique was based around continually twirling her lightsaber, using the momentum generated by this motion to deflect attacks rather than try meeting them head to head. This method was no doubt inspired by the traditional Sarisu move, the Circle of Shelter. Taught to control her lightsaber with her wrists rather than her entire arm, Zana's method sacrificed reach and leverage in favor of maximized precision and control. However, while highly effective and skilled, Zana's style and technique was still rife with problems due to her gross overspecialization. Her negligible physical strength prevented her from using power attacks, and she was virtually incapable of meeting them head to head. Deflection and evasion were her only options. Zana only used her lightsaber for close quarters defense, relying almost solely on her force abilities to retaliate. As far as she was concerned, her lightsaber was nothing more than a shield, and this was reflected by her practice of Suresu. The handle of Xana's lightsaber was slightly longer than normal to accommodate the twin crystals required to power the blades that extended from either end. However, while most traditional double-bladed weapons had blades each measuring a meter and a half or more, those of Xana's lightsaber were slightly under a meter in length. This small but significant difference was critical to the way in which she used her weapon. The smaller blades give you greater speed and maneuverability. Her master explained as the 14-year-old Xana twirled her newly constructed lightsaber in her left hand, focusing on mastering the feel of its unique balance and weight. Grip the handle lightly in your fingers. Control the weapon with your wrist and hand rather than the muscles of your arm. You will sacrifice reach and leverage, but you will be able to create a shield of impenetrable defense. Beyond adapting the style for use with a saber staff, she failed to change or modify it in any appreciable way. And while she took full advantage of all of the benefits of the style, she never overcame any of its inherent weaknesses. While capable of raising an almost impenetrable wall of defense, she's been incapable of mounting any sort of sustained offensive front. That isn't to say that she couldn't utilize offensive sequences to quickly finish vulnerable adversaries, but trying to seize the initiative and overwhelm her adversaries, or even gain ground, has been consistently beyond her capabilities. Despite being encouraged to rely on cunning and patience to best her adversaries, her narrow focus has almost been the death of her on multiple occasions. While Zana was a highly intelligent fighter, she'd been consistently afflicted by what I refer to as tactical tunnel vision, monomaniacally focusing on the adversary at the expense of all other factors. This sort of focus did enable her to better anticipate her opponents and exploit their mistakes, such as how she played Saro Zaj and Johan Othon against one another, but her lack of full situational awareness almost got her killed during her final duel with Darth Bane, when she failed to make note of a pair of fresh graves and lost her footing on a loose, uneven earth. Even her focus on assessing and anticipating her adversaries has been used against her, 
when Bane baited her into attacking him with her lightsaber by tricking her into thinking that he was at a severe disadvantage when unarmed. Her inexperience with mounting offensives, combined with Bane's superior unarmed combat skills, leveled the playing field. At the end of the day, Zana was highly skilled, but grossly over-specialized, and while she is a devastating opponent against ordinary combatants, all she can really accomplish against trained force-wielding lightsaber duelists of equal or near-equal skill is by herself time. As Matt Chapman noted, all she has is a shield and patience. Shock T was one of the most renowned and accomplished Jedi Swordmasters of her era, and Obi-Wan Kenobi considered her one of the Order's most cunning warriors. T chose to specialize in the Ataru and Makashi lightsaber forms, mastering both. Ataru, the fourth form, was a fast-paced martial art with a heavy focus on speed and agility. Makashi, the second form, was developed purely for lightsaber dueling and was marked for its emphasis on fluidity and economy of motion. In addition, Shakti also boasted some skill in Jarkai dual blade fencing, capably wielding an electro staff as her secondary weapon during the Battle of Coruscant, incidentally also demonstrating her skill with this type of staff weapon. Her speed and agility were astonishing and her prowess with acrobatics figured heavily into her fighting style. Acrobatic recoveries and evasions were a prominent feature in her fighting method, and she's been depicted waging a marathon lightsaber duel while continuously on the move. On the flip side, she demonstrated sufficient strength to stagger Galen Merrick during their engagement, using a leap as a fulcrum for a power attack, and was able to fend off the superhumanly powerful blows of Grievous if only for a time. This trait demonstrated that she had compensated for major weaknesses of both the Ataru and Makashi styles, as both were noted for their lack of kinetic force. T was often noted for the elegance and the stylish grace of her technique, which indicates her sophistication and mastery, and Galen Merrick noted her flawless balance and precision, even her most reckless attacks were extremely well placed. However, due to her strong preference for acrobatic maneuvers and flamboyant blade work, she visibly lacked efficiency, but she made up for this with extreme levels of physical stamina. She's been depicted waging a marathon lightsaber battle for an extremely lengthy period of time before tiring. Again compensating for major weaknesses in Ataru and Makashi, Shakti was highly skilled at blast deflection, using a combination of deft blade work and acrobatic dodges, and yet again compensating for major weaknesses in Ataru and Makashi, Shakti was highly effective against multiple opponents and groups. One of the most notable examples being when she held her own against a veritable army of IG-100 Magna Guards during the Battle of Coruscant. During this same engagement, she demonstrated a level of competence with unarmed combat, even managing to overpower a Magna Guard with her bare hands. Notably, she was highly skilled at chaining force-based attacks into her lightsaber sequences, and was even able to maintain a telepathic link to the Felucian Mega Sarlacc in the midst of her fierce duel with Galen Merrick. Shock T was also noted as an ingenious tactician, noted by Obi-Wan Kenobi for her subtlety and experience, and able to balance out between focusing on immediate threats while still maintaining a broader situational awareness. She was able to keep track of and fend off a veritable army of Magna Guards, and was known to have participated in tactical briefings and discussions via Comlink while simultaneously fighting on the battlefield. Her duel with Galen Merrick was a particularly notable display of her ability to multitask in battle, with her dividing her attention between fencing with Merrick, 
minding her surroundings so as to jockey for tactical advantage and maintaining her mental link with the Mega Sarlacc, whose maw served as their battlefield. Whenever fighting on the offensive, Shock T was fast-paced and extremely precise, all the while remaining aware of her surroundings so as to better seize the tactical advantage. Defensively, these same attributes came into play, making her extremely difficult to engage directly due to her evasiveness. On the whole, Shock T possesses an elegant and fast-paced lightsaber technique, backed up by great tactical awareness and ingenuity, and a powerful grasp of the Force. Shock T is the more viable lightsaber duelist, with a much more varied and versatile technique and a broader skill set. Due to Zana's complete lack of any proper offensive capabilities, Shock T would have no trouble at all in dealing with what little Zana is bringing to the table. The only real question is whether or not Shock T could outright penetrate Zana's defenses. On the one hand, Zana's defenses have been consistently beaten by heavy-handed brute force offensives, notably Darth Bane's Form 5 style onslaught, though not without great effort on his part. Conversely, she successfully held off the more fast-paced and technical Ataru style offense employed by Set Hearth. But while Set Hearth was an extremely competent swordsman, he was no master. Shakti is. Due to Zana's situation and circumstances, her exposure to lightsaber duelists has been extremely limited, and the only proper swordmasters that she's actually fought against have been Darth Bane and Saro Zaj, and both were committed power duelists, meaning that she might not even know how to combat Shock T due to her inexperience against duelists with that skill set, and especially of that caliber. While Zana has defeated a competent student of the Ataru style, she's never faced a proper Ataru master and has no experience at all against the Makashi style. Due to Makashi's major differences from all the other lightsaber forms, a lack of experience or familiarity with it is almost a crippling weakness when engaging a dedicated student of the style. This is why Dooku enjoyed such a massive advantage over almost all of his contemporaries, because his skills and movesets were so drastically different from anything that they were trained to deal with. While Zana is a trained duelist with live combat experience against other duelists, very much unlike the Jedi of Dooku's era who only had limited dueling experience, she has consistently demonstrated a weakness when it comes to adapting to anything new. Even Darth Bane, a duelist that Zana spent the better part of her life optimizing herself to combat, repeatedly caught her off guard with the different methods and approaches he applied in each of their fights, damn near killing her each and every time. If the man that she has devoted so much of herself to familiarizing herself with and understanding was still able to do this much to her, how is she going to deal with someone that she has no experience or familiarity with, someone whose methods are completely foreign to her? And the reverse does not come into play, due to Zana's bare bones and staid methods. Beyond adapting Sarisu for use with the Saber Staff, she failed to modify or improve upon it in any way, shape, or form, and remained subject to all of its weaknesses. All Darth Zana can do with her lightsaber is buy herself time. She can't dominate the combat. Shakti can. Shakti gets the edge as a martial artist and lightsaber duelist. When she assumed the mantle of Dark Lord of the Sith, 
Darth Zana was an athletically built human female in her mid-30s. At the time of her death, Shakti was an athletically built Togruta female of uncertain age, though even conservative estimates would place her in her 50s. However, the combination of Jedi physical conditioning and the sustaining power of the light side of the Force means that T's physique would be comparable to Zana's, despite her relatively advanced age. If anything, Shakti actually exceeds Darth Zana's physical capabilities on multiple levels. Even taking Force-based physical augmentation into account, Shakti could dish out and take more punishment than Darth Zana can. Darth Bane only taught Zana how to circumvent her weaknesses, not how to actually overcome them. He steered her towards Sarisu to minimize physical strain due to her lightweight build, but because of this, Zana never became accustomed to strain and never developed physically. While she is by no means fragile, she can't shrug off hits as capably as her master. While all fighters need to maintain their composure in order to remain effective, Zana loses hers more easily than most. I came up with the proverb that I would rather be able to deal with 20 hits without flinching than be able to dodge 19 of them but have the one that connects bringing me down. Zana can dodge 19 hits, but the one that connects will bring her down. By comparison, Shock T is a tank. She's muscled through a blaster wound and fought the warlord Shogar Talk, and survived being buried alive beneath rubble and debris during her first duel with Grievous. While the sustaining power of the Force no doubt played a role in these feats, especially in the latter case, they are still solid demonstrations of her physical hardiness, and that is before we take Shakti's other capabilities into account. The hollow cavities within the monstrals on either side of her head detected infra and ultrasound, providing her with biological sonar, echolocation. A Togruten trait, this ability provided her with enhanced spatial awareness, which bolstered her acrobatic fighting style, and she was able to literally hear the heart rate and breathing of other creatures, allowing her to monitor their physical condition. Darth Zana, being nothing more than a squishy little human thing, has no equivalent abilities. Shock T gets the edge in physical capabilities and handicaps. Darth Zana was a powerful Force-sensitive with an affinity for Sith sorcery, delving into the dark side of the Force to summon arcane energies capable of warping the very fabric of reality. However, this esoteric specialization didn't detract from her more conventional abilities. She's used the Force to augment her physical capabilities, allowing for feats of superhuman speed and agility, such as blast deflection and superhuman acrobatics. However, she's never been known to try augmenting her strength, and as such, power attacks are not part of her repertoire, and she's virtually incapable of meeting brute force offensives head-to-head. -head. As a child, she demonstrated an affinity for telekinesis, instinctively breaking the necks of the two Jedi who killed the Rusanian bouncer that Zana had befriended. Even more notably, she telekinetically disintegrated the right arm of her cousin Darovit. However, while these feats were good demonstrations of her inherent talent and potential, they are not abilities that she's used on a consistent basis, and are not part of her usual repertoire. Her typical uses of telekinesis have been very low-key and defensive. Force poles to retrieve her weapon when disarmed, and force shields to protect herself from the telekinetic strikes of her opponents. While Zana was capable of offensive telekinetic attacks, she typically refrained, as they were useless against force wielders trained to defend against such strikes. Even when such attacks were a viable response, she typically resorted instead to a martial arts takedown with her lightsabers, or a mental assault with Sith sorcery. 
She also demonstrated great skill with more simple telepathic abilities. While capable of traditional mind tricks, Zana preferred to rely on the approach of subtly influencing the emotions of her subject, making them more inclined to agree with her suggestions rather than dominating them outright, as the more subtle effect was more permanent. One of the most notable demonstrations was when she influenced the minds of the Anti-Republic Liberation Front, a terrorist group based on Sereno, making them more inclined to agree with the more violent extremists within their number. Zana was also adept in the use of battle precognition, allowing her to perceive all of the possible actions of an adversary. Thanks to her training, she was able to break down the matrix of possibilities to the most likely actions, allowing her to anticipate and react to her opponent's next movements rather than be overwhelmed by the sheer number of possible outcomes. However, rather oddly for a Sith Lord, Zana displayed no aptitude with or against Force Lightning. She's never conjured it, and her only defense against it was to absorb the bolts with her lightsaber. Due to her natural affinity for Sith sorcery, it was where she devoted the vast majority of her time and energy. She's used obscure Sith spells to cloak her Force signature and hide from other Force wielders, and even used these powers to affect a false light side aura, allowing her to masquerade as a Jedi. In battle, Zana relied primarily on mental assaults and illusions, warping the perceptions of her targets. When used offensively, the illusions work by striking at a subject's worst fears, tormenting them with visions of unimaginable horror. The effect of these images can be so profound that victims have been psychologically destroyed by them, driven to the point of utter insanity. Initially, she needed to perform complex hand gestures to utilize these spells, but by the time she had bested Darth Bane, she was able to do so at will, requiring only a moment to concentrate and gather her energies. However, because the illusions work by playing on the fears and insecurities of a subject, they can be rendered ineffective if the fear in question is something that he or she has already come to terms with and overcome. So instead of being psychologically overwhelmed, the subject recognizes the illusions for what they are. After that, dispelling them is simply a matter of willpower. But even against such an individual, the disorientation and distraction caused by the illusion can still provide Zana with a momentary advantage, though her ability to use this advantage is dependent on how much concentration and effort is required to maintain the illusion. Against Saro Zaj, she was able to cut him down with very little fuss, but due to Darth Bane's strength of will, she couldn't afford to divide her attention and couldn't take advantage. The only true offensive power that Zana has ever used was summoning tendrils of dark side energy capable of dissolving any material, essentially physical embodiments of the destructive power of the dark side of the Force. However, Zana was only able to utilize this ability once, due to the massive demands and labor intensity of the power, forcing her to rely on an external source of energy in the one case, the dark side nexus on Ambria. And even when provided with such an energy source, she only used it as a last ditch maneuver, as it demanded all of her attention and focus, leaving her vulnerable on other fronts. Darth Zana has a wide scope of ability and unorthodox and arcane knowledge and powers at her disposal. However, she is also over-specialized and unsubtle. She blasts apart your hand, tears apart your mind, or disintegrates your physical body with physical manifestations of the dark side itself. She may be a Sith sorceress, but she applies these powers the way a warrior would. She's never needed to incorporate dynamic or intricate strategies into her technique, by virtue of having the powers of chaos poised at her fingertips, and this straightforwardness is arguably her greatest weakness in this field.
Shock T was a noted Jedi Council Master, one of the most powerful force wielders of her day, backing up her overwhelming power with subtlety and refinement. Thanks to her Togrutan heritage, Shakti experiences an instinctive communion with her environment, heightening her connection to the living force and strengthening her force abilities. Accordingly, the more life she is surrounded with, the more powerful she becomes, as there is simply more ambient force energy for her to draw on. A common skill among Jedi-trained Force wielders was using the power of the Force to enhance one's physical capabilities and limits, allowing for otherwise impossible feats of speed, strength, and endurance, and a skill that Shakti was extremely proficient with. She has augmented her reflexes to allow for feats such as blast deflection, and the use of Force-assisted acrobatics and strength are her bread and butter. Acrobatics figured heavily into her fighting style, backing up her strikes and facilitating her evasions. Most notably, she's used Force Augmented Strength to combat the IG-100 Magna Guards, and was capable of driving an Electrostaff through the chassis of such a droid, and even overpowered one with her bare hands. Shakti has also been buried alive beneath a pile of rubble and debris during her first duel with Grievous, holding out long enough for help to arrive, as well as muscling through a severe blaster wound to continue fighting the warlord Shogar Tok. While the latter may have been due to her hardy Togruton physique, the former was almost certainly thanks to the power of the Force sustaining her broken body. Shakti was highly capable when it came to force-based telekinesis, and her combative applications have ranged from destructively powerful to precise and subtle. She has demonstrated the ability to penetrate the defenses of opposing force wielders and attack them in this manner. She was adept at basic level attacks, staggering and injuring foes with powerful pushes and shoves, as well as thrashing them with loose objects. On a more advanced level, Shakti has used her telekinesis to manipulate her lightsaber at a distance, allowing her to strike down targets at range. T also displayed great subtlety with telekinesis, when she used a lull in combat to tie the corner of General Grievous' cape around the coupling on a Coruscant maglev bullet train just before it departed, forcibly removing the General from the field. Shakti was also highly capable when it came to force-based telepathy, performing amazing feats with the power, in addition to the basic mind trick that all Jedi were capable of. Most notably, she maintained a strong mental link with the distributed intelligence of the Felucian Mega Sarlacc while in the midst of fierce combat with Galen Merrick, compelling the creature to come to her aid and attack Merrick. Shakti also had a basic level of competence with Force Deflection, more formally referred to as Tutaminus, and was able to use this power to deflect the lightsaber strike during her first duel with Grievous. However, she was incapable of neutralizing the kinetic energy imparted by the hit and was sent hurling through the air by the force of it. Shakti was also capable of offensive energy-based powers. During her confrontation with Galen Merrick, she utilized a power similar to Kinetite, creating explosive orbs of force energy and hurling them at Merrick. However, while she is willing to use this attack in a lightsaber duel, it is clearly quite labor-intensive, and she requires a pause in the combat so that she can gather her own energies. It should also be noted that she only applied this ability while on Felucia, a jungle world strong in the Force, and thusly a place where her own connection to the Force would be at its zenith, though this is still an impressive display of combative ability. Shakti didn't actually possess a wide range of abilities, and beyond Tutaminus and Kinetite, none of them were out of the ordinary for Jedi-trained Force wielders. What made her so effective and dangerous was instead the variety of ways she's applied the relatively mundane abilities she has at her disposal, 
ranging from focused and destructive to precise and subtle. One of the biggest things to consider is that the most powerful combative abilities for both individuals require powerful sources of external energy due to the labor intensity, or at least they aren't willing to attempt to use these powers without such support. Zana requires the power of the Dark Side Force Nexus in order to summon Dark Side Tendrils, while Shakti requires the ambient life energy of jungles or lush surroundings to utilize Kinetite. Also, in a contest on neutral ground, there are no available creatures for Shakti to influence to aid her, so her telepathic abilities wouldn't come into play. So, now that we have eliminated the impossible, what is the improbable truth that remains? Both have made similar use of physical augmentation to bolster their physical capabilities and their fighting styles, though I feel that Shakti is more competent here. Like Zana, she enhances her reflexes and agility, but also her strength and physical endurance, two attributes that Zana is sorely lacking in. Shakti can dish out more punishment and take more damage. Surprisingly enough, it's actually their telekinetic powers that are cancelled out. While Shakti has successfully penetrated the de defenses of opposing force wielders and attacked them with telekinesis, Zana strongly focuses on defending herself against such attacks, and would more than likely be able to fend off Shakti's shoves and throws. Conversely, Zana's own reluctance to utilize telekinetic strikes against fellow force wielders means that Shakti has very little to worry about. Conventional force-based telepathy is also a non-issue, as both are powerful force wielders trained to resist such influence. Zana has never used force lightning, so that is off the table. Shakti's skill with Tutaminis, on the other hand, actually does have merit here even if its use is purely defensive. The true wild card is Zana's Sith sorcery, and how it would affect T. Zana's powers of concealment and disguise would be useless in a fight to the death, and I already addressed the Dark Side Tendrils, so what remains is her mental influence. The effectiveness of Zana's spells of madness depend very much on the inherent psychology of the user. If the illusions trigger fear and panic, Zana can just push until the target snaps. If they don't, and the target sees the illusions for what they are, then overcoming them is simply a matter of willpower, at which point the spell only has merit as a distraction tool. The new Essential Guide to Alien Species notes that Shakti struggled with bouts of depression due to her separation from Tegruten society, as Tegrutans have strong communal instincts that Shakti simply wasn't able to follow as a Jedi. Also, both of Shakti's initial Jedi apprentices were killed in action after the completion of their training, prompting some among the Jedi to question her training methods. However, both are also something that she has come to terms with, otherwise she would have gone insane on her own, so having this dredged up by Zana's mental assault would only provide a momentary distraction. It's not likely that Zana would be able to take advantage of this, as maintaining the spell calls for continuous concentration, and strong-willed targets increase the labor demands to the point where any distraction on Zana's part spells disaster. Darth Zana is easily the most powerful force wielder of the two, with a broader skill set and a greater scope of ability, but she is limited by her over-specialization and straightforward methods. Shakti's skill set is comparatively mundane, but she uses her abilities much more fluidly and readily, and her methods are much more varied and sophisticated than Zana's arcane spells, which amount to little more than brute force mental assaults. Shakti gets the edge as a force wielder.
Darth Zana wielded the Bane's Heart lightsaber, a custom saber staff designed specifically for the practice of Form 3 lightsaber combat. The blades were shortened to three quarters of the standard length, which is a full meter, and sacrificed reach and leverage in favor of control and maneuverability. While this bolstered her defensive style, it also forced her to rely on extreme close quarters combat when she finally resorted to the offense. The lightsaber utilized a twin set of Sith-style synthetic crystals, one of which was the unique Bane's Heart Crystal, for which the weapon was named. One of the crystal's unique properties was that it was attuned to the owner of the lightsaber and released electrical discharges when anyone other than the owner attempted to use the weapon, acting as a security device of sorts. The special design and properties of Zana's weapon put it miles ahead of Shakti's much more conventional lightsaber. While the saber staff is generally less practical than the standard lightsaber, it does provide a different set of options, some necessitated by the different moveset required for wielding a staff weapon. Plus, Zana's lightsaber is specifically designed to bolster her fighting style, and the unique properties of the Bane's Heart Crystal prevent anyone besides her from using it. The only benefit of Shock T's run-of-the-mill weapon would be her familiarity with her own handiwork. Darth Zana gets the edge in armament and equipment. And now, the verdict. Darth Zana essentially found the perfect fighting method to suit her physique and aptitudes. Using her lightsaber as a shield to buy time so she could gather her energies and retaliate with her force abilities, but the problem is she never progressed from there. So all her technique can do is buy time. She can't dominate the combat. Darth Zana is a swordmaster in the same sense that Darth Plagueis is a swordmaster. It means she knows what she's doing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that she has elevated the practice. At the end of the day, I do not believe that Darth Zana truly mastered Sarisu. While she got the move set down to a T and reaped all of the practical benefits, she never overcame any of the inherent weaknesses of the art, and more than anything else, she never grasped the philosophy. As described in the Jedi Path, Sarisu was the most inwardly directed of all lightsaber forms, to the point where some of the moves of the form are essentially meditative techniques. When truly mastered, the practitioner becomes a pure vessel of the Force, the calm eye of the storm. And we do know that this sort of communion with the Force is possible for Darksiders, Darth Bane and Palpatine being good examples, as both essentially became conduits for the power of the Dark. Zana never achieved this, and rather than uniting her martial skills with her Force abilities, she instead kept the two separate, one foot in each realm. As a result, these skills never became complementary, and the use of one forced her to divide her attention and undermine the use of the other. Because she never truly mastered Sarisu, she never overcame its inherent weaknesses. Essentially, all Zana has ever been able to accomplish against a properly trained opponent has been to buy herself time. All she has is a shield and patience. And Shock T's fighting style is almost perfectly optimized towards combating Zana's. Her use of Ataru would keep Zana under the gun and prevent her from trying anything, while Makashi would enable T to conserve her own energy, bolstering her already impressive stamina and further improving her combative longevity, while the technical sophistication of a fighting style bred for lightsaber dueling would allow her to probe for and strike at any weaknesses in Zana's defense. Darth Zana's particular brand of over-specialization and her narrow range of experience are serious weaknesses against any well-trained duelist, but they amount to a veritable death sentence when engaging a dedicated student of Makashi. 
It should also be noted that Zana's entire style was devised to compensate for her physical shortcomings, so her effectiveness was compromised by the need to tiptoe around these perceived deficiencies. Shakti's fighting style, by contrast, was bolstered by her physique, not undermined. T has consistently dished out more punishment and coped with injury better than Zana, and Zana has no real answer to the infra and ultrasound perception and echolocation afforded to shock T by the organs inside her monstrals. While not fragile, compared to shock T, Zana is a physical lightweight who might as well be made of glass. While she can hold out for quite a significant period of time when operating at her peak, whenever she loses her composure, her frantic responses chew away massive chunks of her energy reserves. I think it's safe to say that Shakti's defensive would off-balance Zana, forcing her to work extremely hard just to keep up, and ultimately tiring her out. At the end of the day, Darth Zana has no effective weapons or complementary skills, Everything was devoted to supplementing Sith sorcery. But ironically for a Sith sorceress who invests so much of herself into the Force, Zana's Force abilities are in fact quite limited. While her telekinetic attacks could be quite deadly, she rarely used them, and oddly for a Sith Lord, she has never used Force Lightning. And to make matters worse, her knowledge and application of the very skill she sacrificed and devoted so much to bolster, Sith magic and sorcery, was itself narrow and over-specialized. All she really has are spells of concealment and disguise, spells of madness, and the dark side tendrils which I suppose could be classified as spells of elemental destruction. Powers of concealment wouldn't accomplish much in arena combat, and the success of the spells of madness hinge on their ability to provoke fear and panic, something that a strong-willed Jedi Master like Shakti just wouldn't do. And while the dark side tendrils may be practically unbeatable, it is also Zana's most labor-intensive power, and all indications are that she requires a massive external source of dark side energy to use it which means that only by some fluke would it be available to her. Even if she could summon the tendrils on a whim, the exhaustive nature of this power means that she would only use it as a last resort, when all other options are exhausted. And of course, there is a good chance that the fight wouldn't even get that far. Due to Zana's major shortcomings as a lightsaber duelist, it is entirely possible that Shakti may defeat her outright, before she has a chance to resort to Sith sorcery. Darth Zana is straightforward and over-specialized with no complementary skills. Shakti, by comparison, is sophisticated, varied, and subtle. Her fighting style balances out between aggressive frenzies and highly technical and precise attacks, working well for both offense and defense. T's conventional force abilities were extremely well developed and had a wide variety of potential uses, but more than anything else, the two skills complemented one another. She's used the force to back up her martial skills and vice versa. Shakti may not possess Darth Zana's supreme command of the force, but she has everything else. I declare Shakti the victor. Alright, ladies, gentlemen, and our secret Cthulhu overlords, remember this is just my opinion, so don't get too bent out of shape just because Darth Zana is your favorite Sith Lord. Special thanks to Matt Chapman for his brilliant visual aesthetic. Be sure to watch his videos and subscribe to him, but don't forget to come to my channel and subscribe to me. Feel free to chime in, short comments below, essays or massive queries message to me here on YouTube or emailed. This is Jen Sarai, the Nerd Rage Ranter, signing off.